Coming up on the Buckeye Guard, the 121st unveils their new operational flight trainer, the National Veterans Memorial and Museum opens to the public in downtown Columbus, and the new Adjutant General shares his vision for the Ohio National Guard. Special guests, including congressional representatives, helped the Ohio Air National Guard's 121st Air Refueling Wing cut the ribbon on a new KC-135 operational flight trainer at Rickenbacker Air National Guard Base in Columbus. Last time I was here, we were talking about a dream, which was to bring this simulator in, and uh, here it is. Two years in the making, really. You know, this is an opportunity uh, for this base to be able to provide uh, for all the, the incredible service members who are with us here today and those all around the country who will come here, better training. But it also really helps us to establish this base as the place to come for training and uh, in particular uh, on the refueling mission. With its fleet of KC-135 Stratotankers, the 121st delivers air refueling, disaster response, and combat support worldwide. The new flight simulator paired with the existing refueling boom simulator, will save millions of dollars in aircraft fuel and provide pilots a safe location for emergency training while conducting mandatory flight experience and time. So I've always wanted to do something to help serve my country, at least do my part in that. And helicopters have always been fascinating. It's just something that I've wanted to involve myself in as a kid, just something I've always enjoyed. My MOS is a 15 Tango, and the Tango portion of it refers to a Black Hawk. And my job entails maintaining, repairing, and making sure that these Black Hawks helicopters are up and ready to fly when they're called upon. These aircraft uh, require quite a bit of maintenance. Uh, some of the maintenance uh, occurs on a calendar basis in different components of the aircraft, so they all have their own schedule. Other maintenance will occur on uh, hours flown basis, of hours of operation, I should say. And then we also have items that just break and need repaired. Most people wouldn't know, but it takes a lot of studying because you have to know where to look because we have log books and technical manuals, but it takes a lot of studying to know what to look at, what to look for. It takes a lot of knowledge and guidance to be able to ask your peers around you who have also been around for longer. Uh, what they do is extremely critical. Uh, a lot of things we do, we measure in 10 thousandths of an inch. Um, errors could cost people their lives. Um, with a full crew and passengers, we can have 14 people in these aircraft, and all their lives depend on what these soldiers are doing. As a full-time maintainer, we take responsibility for two or three aircraft per person, and you'll, whenever you do any maintenance on these, you sign and you put your name on them saying that you specifically did these tasks. So everything we do on these, we verify and we put our names on them saying that this is good to go and you can take my word for it. I'll take ownership of anything that has happened or will happen on these aircraft. Rising from the landscape along the Scioto River in downtown Columbus, Ohio, is the National Veterans Memorial and Museum, the first museum in the United States dedicated to the nation's military veterans. The museum's exhibitions focus on the people, the more than 40 million women and men who have served this nation since its founding, including members of the National Guard. It tells the journey that every veteran has gone through, uh, you know, called to serve, um, the oath of office, basic training, first deployments, combat, coming home, uh, families of the fallen, and then transforming. So it touches. And if you're, if you're not a veteran, it, it informs you on, wow, listen to the voices of these people and, and why they're so passionate. It's a living tribute to individual stories and shared experiences through personal artifacts, letters, pictures, and videos of veterans telling their unique story in their own words. To have uh, uh, a tape about myself and my family was, of course, an honor, an honor to my family. But it really emphasizes, in my mind, the stories here that are being told about those who 
didn't come home, those who didn't survive their military service to enjoy the fruits of, of what they did. I think that anybody who serves should be able to walk into your museum and can see someone or something that they identify with and makes them feel a sense of pride about their service. And that's why I'm, you know, personally proud to be part of this museum. The Animal Assisted Activities Program was developed to help reduce stress and promote emotional well-being for our members here at the 178th. Being in the military comes with additional stressors, especially with the mission that we have here. This program lifts the spirits of members here, creates more of a cohesive team, and takes away kind of the isolation that you can feel. I think one of my favorite things about this program is just watching everyone's face light up and the morale increase in the room when we bring one of the approved animals through. Really taking care of our people is one of the most important things so that they can take care of the mission. Major General John C. Harris Jr. has been sworn in as the 83rd Ohio Adjutant General taking command of the Ohio National Guard. Harris enlisted in the Guard in 1981, and he recently served as the Ohio Assistant Adjutant General for Army. We sat down with Harris to discuss his priorities for the organization and to learn a little more about him. There's a priority and then the rest. And the prime priority will always be readiness. Not only the collective readiness of our units to go accomplish that federal mission that we're called to do, but the readiness to respond to the, to the people of the homeland here in the state of Ohio. I believe that the highest, the highest demand for us as individuals for readiness is, is that homeland response because that's come as you are. There's no pre-mobilization training, there's no spin-up time. When the governor calls us and says, I need the guard for whatever the mission is, we will go as we are. So that means you'd better be physically ready. That means that you'd better be medically cleared. That means that you'd better be dentally ready. Your, your, your administrative documents need to be in order because there is no time to do that. If the citizens of this state need us, they need us now. And I think the standard is four hours. Readiness will always be the prime priority. And then, of course, below that is how we take care of our soldiers and our airmen and our families and our employers as we prepare for those missions. We certainly can't neglect that. And I will certainly be placing a priority on what, what a former Adjutant General, General Wade, labeled as a three-legged stool. There's no such thing as a ready soldier or ready airman unless the family's ready and the employer's ready also. So you'll see increased emphasis from me on those, on those, those levels of readiness, on, on what are we doing with our families. Our, particularly in this environment where we expect so much this, this operational guard, both on the Air Guard and the Army Guard side, where, where deploying is not, not an if, it's a when. And we know that we're going to deploy these folks. We know we're going to deploy them multiple times. I think we need more emphasis on making sure the families are prepared for that. Well, that's an interesting question because it has morphed over the years. Uh, you know, I think the Army definition of leadership really has gotten it right. Um, I've had an opportunity through some other endeavors outside of the Guard to, to not only visit with uh, some of the highest performing organizations in the country, but through the Baldrige program to actually be a judge. So I've had a chance to assess some of the highest performing corporations and companies in, 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 the, in the country. And I truly believe that the Army's gotten it right with its definition that leadership is the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. I think the key word there is influencing. Every leader has to have the ability to use their personal influence to make the people around them better than they think they can be. If you elevate the level of performance of the people around you to a higher level than they thought they could have achieved, then you're a leader. Um, sometimes we focus too much on that, providing purpose and direction, and in my youth that was what I did. I tell you what to do, I tell you how to do it, and, and I'm a leader. Now I understand that that process of influencing by having personal credibility, by building trust uh, to make the people around you better, to empower them to be better, to give them the tools they need to be better, is really what defines a leader. So I enlisted for pretty much the same reason that most of our soldiers and airmen enlisted. I, I was looking to pay for college. My dad was in the Guard, and my dad kept recommending the Guard. And I kept saying no and saying no. And I got accepted to Ohio State. And then I realized, my gosh, I've got to figure out how to pay for this. So I joined the Guard. I was going to do six years, get out, and I fell in love with it. I really did fall in love with it.
see more about the Ohio National Guard, go to ong.ohio.gov or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.